Good afternoon, folks. Uh, this is Trini uh, from MBM 98. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Nikhil and the whole team for inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, I belong to the social sector as much as I studied MBM. Um, I'd like to share my perspective of the social sector, particularly given the crisis that's going on. Um, what role does it play? And what are some of the changes that can be expected in the coming uh, future? As I speak about the potential changes and shifts that may happen in the social sector, obviously opportunities will arise, okay? In some cases, voluntarily. In some cases, uh, involuntarily. We'll talk about that, okay? There was a similar crisis, which all of us recall, not more than 10 to 12 years ago, which was the global financial crisis of 2008. And for many of you from my batch, we were in the midst of an earlier crisis, which was the Asian financial crisis. Uh, but in the 2008 crisis, it actually made fundamental shifts to the social sector as well. I will talk about that in a short while. Okay. My presentation, which I think is not more than 30 to 40 minutes, uh, and I've just got three slides to be honest, uh, is going to focus on three things. It will introduce you, introduce you all to the social sector, not that you don't know much about it, but I will try to refresh your uh, understanding of this. I'll tell you what's happening, where. I put the context a little bit focused on India to a certain extent and to a certain extent uh, in the US because of reliable data available. I also have put some comparative data for the Philippines, for example, where I'm based. Okay? So we'll talk about the sector the general dynamics of the sector. I'll tell you in very brief, uh, and this is unraveling as we speak, of what the social sector is doing whilst the crisis is happening. More importantly, you will realize, as I explained, the role of the social sector uh, itself happens in multiple stages. I will explain the stages in slide number two so that you understand why some organizations are able to respond, some are not able to respond, and some have a much bigger role to play post the crisis, so to speak, um, in the context of lockdowns and things like that, because this crisis is gonna be playing out for a long time and we will take a look at how this will work. Yeah, The last slide, um, interestingly enough, we'll talk about the opportunities that the social sector can throw up, not only for you, but for many of you who are my age and probably some who are a little bit senior and some who are probably much younger, you may be in a position to encourage quite a few people to look at the social sector as an option, okay? Either full-time or as a part-time. Now, I will not be very surprised if some of you are already working in the sector in various capacities. I know for a fact, many of my classmates are actually uh, quite, quite active volunteers in the time of any crisis, let alone uh, this particular crisis. And they act either individually, collectively as a group, as classmates, and in many cases, as part of institutions and groups they are associated with. So it's not that Many of us who are doing other things are not involved in the social sector. We are directly or indirectly involved in the social sector. However, what I'll discuss in the last slide will be about why not look at this as a major consideration, okay? And I coin a term uh, which is already being widely used, which is all about doing good and being well at the same time. And we'll talk about that from the context of a classic MBA uh, student uh, kind of a perspective. Okay, so uh, Nikhil, uh, sorry, I, this is the first time I'm doing it. Uh, do I take questions? No, you in between, or should I just, yeah, no, I'll just continue. You finish your presentation for 40, 35 to 40 minutes. All right. And 
minutes will be question they will raise their hands and i will call them out one by one all right thanks a lot appreciate it you get a flow free flow okay Bye. thank you thank you very much okay all right um i hope i'm coming across quite uh, clearly so let me start with the uh, actual discussion uh, itself right um here are some numbers to throw at you and as we all know as products of aim okay uh, the numbers as usual tell a story okay uh, in india we have over 3 million ngos i was going to make this into a dramatic question and answer kind of a thing but i think online learning is something i am getting used to even though i set up a company way back in 2000 producing e learnings and selling it in by the thousands in the cd form right but but these were self paced learning but doing virtual instructor led training kind of a setup as we have i am unable to do this but this is the number which may come as a big surprise quite a number of ngos in india similarly in the philippines where i am based there are about 300000 ngos okay and the us if we can use that as a context okay because there is very very reliable data there uh, there are about 1 and 1/2 million ngos now what defines an ngos and by the way in the us the more popular term is nonprofits and i think we should stick to the term nonprofits because i have been accused of explaining ngos to many people as no good organization right uh, so you know uh, i've been i've been blamed quite a bit for that but i always felt quite a few of the ngos actually work to that acronym but we will see why that's the case and why all of you might have an opportunity to shift this sector to become a much more proactive sector they are already doing a lot of good work but i think they can certainly get a lot of help from trained professionals like all of you out there okay now just talking about the india numbers okay you can take a an idea okay and you can be clear about the fact that if there are 3 million odd ngos there there is both direct and indirect employment both full time and part time employment by the millions just in this sector people talk about around 2% to 5% of any country works either directly or indirectly in the social sector so it's not a small sector at all okay so uh, but in a country like india with crores of people this of course is not more than 2 3 maybe 4 crores of people working in this sector okay so just to give you an idea of how uh, the numbers stand these ngos or non profits come in all shapes and sizes work on various teams or either very large having both national and regional outlooks or could be very small at a community level and there's no harm in being either small or large uh, i think what we are actually looking for is the good social impact they make create okay and in many cases they do however most of them like with any small medium business are very founder dependent and those are the things that one could look at and see how it can be improved and i will talk about some of the great changes that have been taking place just in the last 10 years if not a little bit before that okay and i'll tell you also why it happened and why this particular crisis that we are facing right now could mean some more changes for the better for this particular sector all right so uh, jim collins i think all of you are very very familiar wrote this uh, seminal work on good to great also wrote a book called the good to great for the social sector okay the good to great was a very very bright red looking book yeah, red colored uh, cover okay bright and red uh the good to great in the social sector while you are at it you might as well google it it is a blue colored book it uses the same analogy of good to great but applies it across the social sector and 
he says right at the beginning that the social sector, unlike the for-profit sector, for example, uh, is a bit more challenging to manage purely because the organization's mission itself is a little bit always mixed up. For, for a for-profit for business, I think the singular mission is very clear. I'm sure there are so many other things that they're all working towards, but clearly uh, shareholder value, enhancing profitability is a single mission they work towards and they do a very good job of it. Whereas in the case of a social sector, while they may have stated mission statements, I think the way they get to it is a bit muddled because when they speak a little bit more about money, people frown upon them, people who don't understand the sector as much. Uh, when they talk about a lot of processes, again, people get frowned upon thinking that, hey, aren't we supposed to be this freewheeling, do-gooders, tree-huggers kind of a thing? Well, that is the popular concept of how an NGO typically looks like, but no longer the case, right? Uh, the larger NGOs or the nonprofits across the globe I speak about organizations like Habitat for Humanity, Feeding America, Teach for America, which now has chapters all across the globe, including India, which uh, you have Teach for India, are all multi-billion dollar entities where they do as much management as any other organization, whilst at the same time create, creating meaningful change. I personally, for one, as somebody who's actually started businesses and still run businesses, um, albeit not as directly as I used to, still believe that even running a business is as social as you can get. Because the moment you create jobs for more than one person, that is yourself, I think the business of one, I think you're already being socially responsible. Okay, so all the more when you have hundreds and thousands of people that you could employ, uh, through your business or the business that you work for. So in my opinion, all of them also belong to the social sector. But let's, let's focus no, in this particular case. So uh, the management is a challenge, but we will get to that. There are good boys and there are not, I won't call the bad boys, but the ones who struggle because of this management vacuum. Okay. Now, if we were to talk about a value chain, if you, use the, if you use the value chain model for the social sector, I think there are several players, okay, obviously, uh, but the two key players, apart from the nonprofit itself, is the one which provides the inputs, that means in kind or in cash, which is what we call a donor. And then the ones you use this resources to benefit. Okay, so somebody who gets the benefit, which is the beneficiary, it could be an individual, it could be a group of individuals, it could be a community, it could be young people, it could be farmers. So th those are the key uh, uh, beneficiaries. Of course, as with any value chain, there are several other intermediaries who come in between, you know, for communication, public relations, all those activities. But it's useful to understand that we have these two basic components to the spectrum of the value chain. One is the donor who gives and the other is the beneficiary who benefits from all the work or the value addition that the non-NGO does by receiving this money or in-kind donation into something very useful for the beneficiary. Okay. Now, where would these things not work if the non-profit doesn't understand what the beneficiary wants? If the non-profit doesn't understand what the donor wants, as usual, there will be problem in this value chain. But for anybody who understands this reasonably well, a well-organized nonprofit, okay, albeit a social organization, can play a very good role of an intermediary between the beneficiary as well as those who have good intentions to give. Okay. Now, donors, uh, I'm not going to talk about beneficiaries because they could be a myriad of beneficiaries, but the donors in general are broadly classified into two. We have the institutional and individual donors. Now, to give you an idea, um, um, US in 2018 gave over $400 billion. Okay. US citizens 
individuals gave over $400 billion. Now, I've been tracking this for over 10 to 15 years, and it used to be about $300, million, $300 billion a year, okay? But as late as 2019, for the report of 2018, uh, the number is about $429 billion. Now, there is no other country which has data in such detail, okay? I mean, I'm sure the Indians also give a lot, okay? We give it in many forms. Um, we give it to uh, places of worship. We give it to charities. We give it to faith-based organizations. Uh, we obviously give it to very good nonprofits. So I think if we have the count, we will also realize we do give a lot as well, okay? However, in the U US, uh, this is publicly available data. You just have to Google Giving USA, which is a website which actually generates this data. The US government actually hardly gives about $30 billion. And in the last two years, there is talk of this being cut down. Okay. Now, what the US government gives is money that is considered as official development assistance, that is, this is the US government giving money for official development assistance for use for doing development work outside the US. Obviously the US government invests a lot more money within the US for doing social welfare. Okay, as with any ministry, Ministry of Home Affairs in India, Ministry of uh, Social Welfare in the Philippines, these are all ministries. And then, Obviously, the government is the number one spender in the social sector. Uh, so the numbers that I'm reflecting here when I say 30 billion as government giving, this is money which has been given externally. However, the money that I mentioned as individuals, the $400 billion, 90% of that money is actually used within the US and probably about $40 billion is spent overseas. Let me give you an example. We work with JP Morgan. JP Morgan gives out about $300 million a year, just to give you an idea, in terms of social giving, out of which I would say about 250 billion, if not 275 billion, uh, million, sorry, uh, is actually spent within the US. They do a lot of programs on financial literacy. They do a lot of programs on small- Srini, Srini. Yes? Srini. Uh, somebody has told me that your voice is breaking. So oh. switching off the video, will it help? Switching, switching off the, the video? video? Sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I will. It was, I just will. got a comment. Okay, okay, okay. And I'll also try to keep it slow. Please, if anybody has any concerns, do let Nikhil know. And I will do the needful. Now, I've just got to figure out how to do that. Okay. Uh, start video, Kupar. That cross mark is there. Start video, just uh, uh, click it. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Done. Okay. Done. Okay. So um, I, I was uh, speaking. Uh, let me just go back. Am I on slideshow again still? Yeah, you're on slide. That's okay. That's all right. That's okay. okay. So, uh, I, I was just sharing with you the majority of any country's giving is obviously the money is used internal to the country. And of course, uh, some of it is used externally. In Asia, China leads the pack, okay? Uh, Australia uh, follows very closely. India also does a lot of giving. We have seen it in just the last few weeks. Um, of course, extraordinary situations brings out the best in people in my opinion. Uh, so we have seen a lot come out, but Nonetheless, the data is hard to come by, okay? Uh, the last official data for, the, for Asia was put out by MasterCard who tracked giving through card-based donations. So I still don't think that is quite accurate, but that's what was received, which sort of puts all the countries in perspective in Asia, okay? Uh, some more things that are happening, and then before I move on to the next slide so that I don't take up too much time, is that there is a rise in the last 20 years, particularly, uh, of national giving versus foreign funding. Now, 
It's also because nations across Asia from the 80s, from the rise of the Asian tigers, uh, the prolific nature of the ASEAN, uh, and of late, of course, China over the last 20 years and India, um, national giving has actually increased quite dramatically. Okay, And foreign funding, uh, particularly foreign funding which comes through foundations, are being viewed with a lot of uh, suspect, right? So, the, so there has been that uh, element to it. In fairness, I wouldn't like to go in and comment on that, but in my opinion, if there's no foreign funding, it's fine, provided the national level giving hopefully increases, right? Um, but I think in a country like India, people do a lot of social good and a lot of giving through various means. So, you know, many of it is not recorded. Many of you just sitting across this particular uh, 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 sort of conversation, this Zoom uh, webinar, uh, may be doing your bit for charity uh, and it's not officially recorded in many ways. I have been a beneficiary of my own classmates helping uh, for one of the online crowdfunding um, campaigns that I just did as a matter of fact just a month ago and funny enough that online campaign which we fully achieved was all about developing a board game for disaster management for India okay so you know as things would have it we are in the mother of all disasters as we speak okay uh, another major shift or change which has happened in the sector, uh, I wouldn't talk about the shift at this, as, uh, as of now, the last 20 years has actually seen a lot of tech for good initiatives. In the past, you would have tech entrepreneurs who became high net worth individuals giving away a lot of money. Okay. Uh, however, now you see also a lot of tech companies who would like to use tech for good. The infamous, if I may say, or famous, depends on which way you want to look at it, uh, TikTok as a TikTok for good, by the way. You may want to take a look at it, okay? Uh, Google for good is there, uh, uh, and Microsoft has been doing it through many, many, uh, through and for many, many years, okay? So, in summary, uh, the social sector is extremely vibrant. There's a lot of nonprofits. By the way, uh, BCCI in India, the, the, the cricket board, is also considered a non-profit. Tirupati Tirumala Devasthanam, which is one of the richest places of worship, uh, and the foundation which is behind that, is also considered a non-profit. Okay? So you can clearly imagine uh, they don't look at themselves as an NGO in the conventional terms. So, you know, sports associations, CII, Fiki, they are all by status nonprofits. So there is some level of cleaning up happening, okay? And these kinds of institutions are now spoken about as non stock nonprofit. They are not talked about as civil society organizations or NGOs. However, if we go by uh, the definition of uh, uh, um, your SEC registration or your papers of registration, which is the only way to, you know, at least make a list of the number of nonprofits out there. I think the 3.3 million will include these kinds of institutions as well. But the majority are probably civil society organizations of various shapes and sizes. Okay, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you absorb that for a minute. Okay, and I'll quickly shift to the next slide keeping an eye out for the time, and man, I've actually run out of a lot of time, okay? Um, I'll try to keep this slide very brief, okay, even though it seems to have a lot of uh, uh, points, but I just wanna point out for this particular crisis, as always, the primary actor which drives any response to a disaster will always be the government. Okay, the primary actor, but they can't do it alone. A lot of others would join in the private sector, the civil society and everybody else. But the primary actor, 
as well as the primary orchestrator, at least in the initial days of a major disaster, typically is the government because they have the infrastructure, they have the processes, they have the controls in place so that things don't get out of control. Okay. But what is very interesting or important to note is post any crisis, there is several stages that one goes through, right? The immediate response that happens, uh, there is reparation, okay? There's rehabilitation, restoration, and recovery. So, you know, no crisis is going to just disappear overnight, okay? The impact of the crisis are yet to unravel in this case. In some cases, it's unraveled and it's facing us straight on our face, um, staring at us very dearly and directly. Um, so if you look at this, the social sector has a role to play in each of these phase. Now, depending on their shape, size, capacity, capability, the NGOs or nonprofits, I, I use it alternatively, social organizations will play different roles, different roles, okay? For example, if you were to Google, uh, if you were to search or go into the website of Akshay Patra right now, they are talking about preparing one crore meals, okay, in response to this crisis, okay? Uh, obviously, over a period of time, being given, they, they've been doing this already fantastic job uh, already for years, um, but Specifically to this, they've been talking about that right on their website and they are doing fundraising as well for that. Okay. So they are an organization, in my opinion, who are called as point number four makes out. They are an excellent service delivery organization. Okay. Service delivery NGO. Okay. And there are some NGOs which are, on the other hand, primarily advocacy based NGOs. Okay, they, they, they take up a cause. Shrini, for, yes, Shrini, yes. sorry. Can you make that slide into a slideshow? Because we uh, can't see to the screen. I see. I'm sorry. Uh, is that clear? Yeah, that's clear. Okay. okay. That's why I was just checking whether it was on slide mode. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, obviously, this is free to be shared with everybody. Okay, post this session. Um, so the service delivery and advocacy based NGO, there are some NGOs which straddle both, okay, uh, which is fair enough. And that's the way it should be theoretically. But, you know, certain NGOs are designed to be one or the other. There's no harm in it either. But typically, uh, uh, um, a good NGO should be able to do both service delivery and or advocacy. And in this case, and advocacy. Okay. So I just spoke about the various stages and the fact that the social sector has a significant role to play in each of this. And depending on their capacity and capability, they would be playing part-time, partly part roles, full roles uh, in some stages, not in some stages, etc., cetera, et cetera. But in my opinion, the real work is yet to start. Okay. And, uh, um, particularly skills development. I think the migrant issue, everybody understood it and people were painting a bad uh, image of migrants for the longest time, but they realize how critical they are and how vulnerable they are. I think a lot of action is going to now get spearheaded uh, on dealing with migrant issues post COVID, okay? We still need migrants in each of the large cities. These are the economic hotspots. So people have to come there, work there, but probably now NGOs are going to say, you know what, why don't we give them additional skills in the evenings along with a free meal so that these guys can actually upgrade their skills, potentially make them safe and resilient for the next crisis if it happens, or probably take back this vocation, go back to their own city or own town and become a small entrepreneur. Okay, so these things are going to happen. So those things, I think in the next 12 to 24 months is going to be a lot of activities for the social actors to be getting onto it. For after this crisis is completely forgotten, put back in the minds of people, the ones who will be really working 
on these longer standing issues, my friends will be actors from the social sector. Okay. Okay. Now let me go to the last slide. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, and, and this is where I want to talk about uh, why the social sector could be very interesting for all of you here or for people amongst your family or for some of you who may have adult children who are looking at careers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. But let me, before we even go into that, let me speak about the convergence which has been happening in the social sector in this particular uh, 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 decade or a little bit over this decade in the last 20 years. Okay. The definition of the social sector has dramatically been increased. Okay. Uh, you have social enterprises, you have your traditional NGOs and CSOs. CSO stands for civil society organization. Then you have nonprofits. You know, I mean, as I said, uh, I, I was using NGOs and nonprofits alternatively and to mean the same thing. But like I said, the CIIs, the FICIs, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, the various sports associations, the various faith-based organizations who are, who are actually doing a lot of good work, but have a very clear mission towards that are all nonprofits uh, and they, they form part of the social sector. Of course, all of we know that CSR has become a big thing. Um, as we speak, the CSR market, if I may use the term, is around three to four billion dollars in India alone. Okay, and that is just from some of the corporations, and 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 um, this is bound to grow. Okay, it has become mandatory since 2013. Then you know, after muddling around for the for the few years after that, I think it's now more streamlined. Okay, which means it could be both good and bad. We'll won't go into the bad part right now. But close to three to four billion dollars is come into the system for doing social impact through a new player, which is the CSR player. But let's be clear, over 50 years, over 75 years, corporations have been providing these kinds of great work, even before it was made mandatory. However, I think a lot of people who just had intentions have been forced to act because of the CSR law. Now, on top of this, you have foundations, which are both corporate and uh, 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 family foundations, fa foundations which are set up by high net worth individuals. Okay, uh, in the last one week, you would have seen Omidyar Network, HCL Foundation, um, people like that releasing grants for post COVID response in India. Okay, and then you have the IOs, as we call them, international organizations, UN, World Bank, ADB, all these multilateral development banks. So things, uh, institutions that you're very, very familiar with who are also in the fray, okay? Not to mention the government itself. So there has been a convergence which is happening in the last 20 years, all the more in the last 10 years. Let me tell you what has happened, okay? And that's the point number, uh, the last point, but I'll allude to it right here. When the financial crisis happened in 2008, 2009, let me ask, I mean, I, again, this is not interactive at this point. Many of you would have heard of the terminology of impact investment, social bonds, and all those things. None of this existed in its form just 10 to 12 years ago, okay? Social enterprise as a terminology was started already 25 years ago by Skoll Foundation, by Ashoka. Let's be clear, for want of a better word, I don't think anybody gave a shit about it at that time, okay? Uh, but all of this changed in the last 12 to 13 years when quite a few people from the very articulate banking sector started looking for other alternatives because of various reasons. Probably uh, they lost their job. Probably they thought they've had enough of it. The crisis is made it worse, let me go on a new course. And they have created a completely new sector, uh, exciting sector. I, I, I've never seen, you know, you've seen all these things happen in the last 10 to 12 years, you know, all these impact funds that you keep hearing about and seeing. And it's all 
if you go to the root of it, you will find a ex banker who's behind that. Okay. Um, IIX, that's the Impact Investment Exchange, Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, um, Avishkar in India, okay, they, they run um, Sankalp, which is an event, they've been running it for 10, 12 years now. I mean, let me be clear, they're doing excellent work, but they were sort of forced or started focusing on this sector because of the crisis that happened. And today, a few trillion dollars is available as impact funds, okay? I think a couple of years ago, it breached a trillion dollars. I won't be surprised uh, if the numbers have doubled since then, right? Uh, even the UN has set up a UN social impact fund, okay? Um, mostly positive change. Of course, a few negative change because they came... Uh, they saw and they thought they can conquer, but it's not that easy, okay? Uh, the challenges of poverty in the emerging economies, particularly in India or the Philippines or developing Asia, I'm not even touching Africa here, is much more deep-rooted. Just going and saying, I will build you, I'll teach you a skill does not help them get a job. They need a lot of polishing. They have to overcome a lot of prejudice, not just in the society, but also some pre-set uh, pre, pre uh, notions they might also have and carry with them, okay? But it did open up the sector to some additional level of sexiness, which was never available before, okay? Um, so the sector is actually doing well right now, okay? The people who struggle still struggle, okay? That's because not a lot of people collaborate, okay? I think there's a great opportunity to collaborate, Okay, 3.3 million NGOs are trying to do their own thing. If many of them merge, in fact, there's a book on mergers and acquisitions in the nonprofit sector. US has seen a lot of NGOs merge, I mean, larger ones, okay? But many of the smaller NGOs typically don't tend to merge because of a concept or because of a syndrome called the founder syndrome. I and mean, the founder would like to think of himself or herself as God's gift to mankind. But I suppose that's the same in any small business as well, okay? What is great that is happening, and we are a witness to that personally, is that a lot of young people are looking at that sector with a very open mind. A lot of people who have studied in Ivy League schools, the equivalence of Ivy League schools across the globe, uh, could be in India, could be in the UK, could be in Singapore, are looking to sort of enter the career or job market or enter their first stages of their first job, uh, looking at this sector, you know, saying, hey, you know, I can do some interesting work, some meaningful work, yet at the same time, uh, I also learn the tricks of the trade, so to speak, of how to behave in a workplace and things like that. So that's fantastic, okay? Um, unfortunately, as I said, or fortunately, depends how one looks at it, uh, this crisis is also going to throw the job market in a spiffy. Um, I think I think we wouldn't wish for it, but I'm sure a few uh, people are going to lose their jobs. A uh, few senior people, okay. Um, that's what my friends tell me when I speak to them uh, in the last one or week, one week or two weeks in the U.S. and things like that. Um, they're saying we are seeing that happening. So it's not just about the people who have lost the jobs, the people who are in, working in restaurants and things like that. But in about three months time, I think the real cost cutting for recovery will happen. And quite a few top talents will lose their jobs. And maybe, maybe for them, the social sector might be the beginning of a very interesting second chapter. Now, whether that could be as a full-time role, whether that could be a fractional role, whether it is uh, joining a board of a nonprofit or volunteering with a nonprofit, I think for many of you and your friends that I hope you could share this with, uh, I think I think uh, this is a great opportunity for you to help the institutions make a bigger impact. You know, I mean, as individuals, we do create impact, but as an institution. I think a lot more can be achieved. So if your innate skills, which may or may not be available with a nonprofit, can 
uh, and if that nonprofit can benefit from that, why not? Okay. Um, the case for fractional leadership, where maybe three or four nonprofits pay for you, and you spend one day here, another day there, or a couple of days here, and a couple of days there, is a possibility. Okay. So uh, uh, you help them, and they are going to certainly help you back. So it doesn't have to be all charity. Okay. After all, we are uh, going to profess the principles of do good and do well. And with that, let me also wish you all well, keep safe, uh, keep well, and feel free to ask questions. I'll stop here. Thanks, Srini. Uh, Thank those who want to ask questions, please raise their hands so that I will unmute only that person. And the request is after you ask a question, please mute yourself. So first question, um, Mukund Venkatram, please go ahead. Mukund, please go Hi, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, hi, uh, Srini, this is Mukund here from MM85, so that's quite some time back. I had one question. Uh, you'd mentioned that there are about 3.3 .3 million uh, NGOs uh, in India and, and a host of others overseas. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, uh, issues which does come about is fundamentally is that is there a way you could rate these uh, NGOs? How do you know which one is doing well, which was isn't doing well? Right. You know, when, when you're looking at it from a CSR perspective, when you're looking at a contribution, you like to really understand whether the money you're donating or you're giving it to a particular purpose works well or doesn't work well. So how do you? Okay. How, uh, how do um, you? Uh, you know, what's what's the mechanism, or is there a, a rating agency on this kind of sure, space? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Mukund. I appreciate you joining the call as well. Uh, oh. uh, so, number one, um, let me start with the U.S. and then I'll draw parallels to India. Um, there are there are two rating agencies. Okay, um, I mean this is like doing any due diligence, I would suppose. So, one is called GuideStar. Okay, by the way, GuideStar has an India chapter. It's run by a very able lady called Pushpa Aman Singh. Um, GuideStar is the name. Okay, you can just look it up. Um, the second one, and this is only available in the US at this point of time, is the Charity Navigator. Okay, and it does give you ratings. And you will see a lot of charities, particularly the larger ones in the US. By the way, when we say there are 1.5 million NGOs in the US, Okay, uh, very similar to how industries work, right? SMEs make up around 95% of the economy, they say, you know, 90, it's in the, it's in the higher uh, part of uh, the 90%, right, percentile. So same happens with the NGOs, right? So you have your big boys, which probably make up about 5% to up, maybe up to 10%. Then you have medium-sized players, and the majority of the NGOs are extremely small, if not small, okay? So for them, the only way to do is hardcore due diligence, okay? Uh, if they have annual reports and things like that. Uh, and to a certain extent, if it is about smaller numbers, then, you know, you take a, a gut feel approach. Obviously, that's not what we want to do if it's a CSR donation. That's why, unfortunately, what happens is uh, most of the money goes to the usual suspects, but rightly so, because they are, they are, uh, well organized, they have their reports in place, they have annual reports, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But talking specifically about these rating agencies, you have GuideStar, you have Charity Navigator. In India, NASCOM Foundation also maintains a list of NGOs that they have validated. Now, why has NASCOM Foundation validated NGOs? They have validated NGOs because NASCOM Foundation is a conduit for doing software donations to NGOs. For example, Microsoft gives out the equivalent of $1 billion of software licenses for free, okay? And that in turn is actually given to NGOs. Okay, let's say I run an NGO, I need 50 licenses of Microsoft, then I can approach NASCOM and NASCOM would do the validation and say, okay, I think you are eligible to be given this. Now their validation process follows a few checklists and questions that they have. It's not as complicated as Charity Navigator or GuideStar. 
but it is available. Now, in a country like the Philippines, just saying that being registered with the SEC, by the way, out of the 3.3 million NGOs, many of them need not be even registered. Okay, they could be small community-based organizations and they will continue to struggle, but in many cases, they do meaningful work within their community and they're just happy. And their donors tend to be from within the community also. So, you know, they're happy where they are and they create very deep impact in the small communities they work uh, uh, for. So yes, there are certain uh, uh, measuring agencies and metrics available. Uh, feel free to connect with me. I, I can connect you with the people also in India who are behind that actually. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, Girish Gelly. Hi Srini, hope you're well. Hey, thanks Girish, very well man. Go ahead. Good to see you, nice session Srini. Srini, I was just uh, wondering, you know, post this uh, uh, entire COVID, you mentioned there are two categories of uh, donors. You know, you have the business and individuals on one side, and then you have the government on the other. So, do you think, uh, you know, especially now that a lot of businesses and individuals are trying to conserve cash, mm -hmm. there will be a change in the funding pattern for the NGOs? And do you think there will be a completely different set of priorities mm -hmm. um, that uh, you know post uh, COVID? That uh, is, are there new areas of focus? of uh, the social sector hereafter? Absolutely. Um, I, I think you brought a very valid point, uh, something I should have covered. Um, the downturn, any downturn for that matter is going to affect business and business. if it affects business, it affects also the social sector. Okay. Uh, having said that, having said that, this is where the government typically kicks in. Okay. A lot of service delivery ultimately needs to get done. So, the government is in no place to get these things done. So they will reach out to businesses, by the way, as well as to nonprofits to get this uh, service delivery done, whether it is for reconstruction, whether it is for uh, reskilling, whether it is for disbursement of uh, conditional cash or food or whatever it is. So I think typically after crisis, there is usually a spike of activity, okay? And already in line with what you just asked, the OECD countries, the countries which are considered as fully developed and belong to this OECD network, about 22 countries, only two of them are from Asia, Japan and Korea, uh, apart from Australia. Um, OECD, for example, Germany has just launched a grant for use, of the, for use by the private sector, but for doing social good, okay? So in the absence of CSR budgets within companies, companies can actually partner with the government, okay? Or with the NGOs and still do meaningful work. But I do expect some uh, slowdown um, for the sector in general, but typically, as you may have heard, uh, um, ADB is just earmarked $20 billion for, uh, some as aid package, you know, obviously national governments are supposed to get it and then use it. ADB is also earmarked a couple of billion dollars where they would like to directly do technical assistance. When they do direct technical assistance, they will need the help of the social sector. Um, so I think opportunities will become as somebody who tracks grants on a regular basis through our portal called Asian NGO. Um, uh, I can share with you that in the last two weeks, 28 new grants have been released, okay? Um, all related to post-COVID, okay? Uh, of course, the majority of the grants are in the research uh, space where, you know, the people are willing to fund any form of research leading to vaccines and cu curative drugs, uh, but there are already grants available for mitigating uh, negative impacts, particularly negative employment and things like that. Um, I mentioned two grants just out of India, one from HCL Foundation, another from Omidia Network, not necessarily Indian, but exclusively focused on India. Um, so I feel that many of the institutions which have earmarked funds will still go ahead and spend it. Uh, but I think there will be a downturn, if not in the short term, in the medium term at least. Yeah. I'll stop there. Manish Panchal, please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi, Shrini. Fantastic session. Uh, while you were mentioning about uh, donors and list of uh, such stuff, you mentioned about impact fund exchange. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you can throw some light on that. No, the um, I, it, actually it's impact investment exchange. Uh, I, I, that's a specific organization based out of Singapore, run by a, a Bangladeshi origin uh, lady does great work, Doreen Shanaz. She's ex-Goldman Sachs, okay? So before the financial crisis, obviously she was a high-flying flying executive of Goldman Sachs. I think she has used her knowledge of uh, how markets work, how funds work, and established investment, uh, uh, impact investment exchange. Her idea was to even float a sort of a stock exchange for impact funds um, that never came into fruition. Um, I think it did in some place like Maldives or something, but, but um, never took off in a big way. But they were able to raise a lot of money from you know, KKR, uh, from, from investment funds who were willing to give out a few million dollars here and there to do social impact studies, to do proper due diligence, to encourage social organizations to become social businesses, okay? So um, that's just one institution. So I'm, I'm speaking about a particular organization there, but similarly, there are several. Wilgrow Foundation in India is one, okay? They've been handling about $30 million of impact funds from various donors, and in return, have been investing in over 150 impact-inducing or impact-producing uh, social enterprises. Yeah. So, so that's what I was uh, trying to speak about actually. Uh, I'm, and I'm happy to share a lot more information on that space. Yeah. Uh, Shrini, yes, there sir. is a question from Dr. Malini Shankar, uh, ex IAS officer. She is on, on the chat, but she has put a question here. Her yeah. question is Do you have the latest breakup of the sectors being supported by non profits in India? Uh, I think I tried to cover it in a single catch it all slide saying that uh, the nonprofits work on various sectors, work on various sizes of projects, works on various geographies. If you take India, for example, obviously uh, you have your top three, you know, education, health. Um, these are, these are always some things which keep on uh, happening, you know, skills and things like that might fall under education, for example, health, uh, livelihoods, uh, farmer related work. Um, the easy way to look at it, at least in the last five years, is to look at what NGOs are doing in alignment with the sustainable development goals set up by the UN. Okay, there are 17 goals. Okay, invariably, I would say about six to seven of those goals. Okay. Uh, reducing poverty, uh, zero hunger, um, equal opportunity, gender. Um, um, so then there is a whole bunch of things which are related to climate and environment, right? Life on land, life below water, um, uh, climate change, you know, those kinds of activities. So I don't know if there is a clear sectoral breakup which says this NGO works on these things. It will be ideal if it is there, but NGO related data itself is very hard to come by in Asia, not just in uh, India. Um, but slowly, organizations like us, both through Asian NGO and Impact, um, by the way, Impact is a magazine meant for the nonprofit sector as well as for people who are in the fringes of the nonprofit sector. The India Development Review, which is um, being published by uh, as an online digest being published by Ashoka University, okay, are fantastic uh, resources where you could find the latest information. But is there good data, as in research data, available? No. We have actually approached quite a few organizations to fund such data, okay, um, uh, to fund such data gathering or put together studies. Uh, nothing has come. Um, the last time we were approached was by Credit Suisse, 
but they were interested to do this study for southern China, you know, looking at a NGO mapping, okay, of who is doing what, where, and what sector, and what sort of capacity they have. We did something similar in the Philippines, which was a NGO mapping, so that we know exactly when, of the, at the time of a crisis in particular, which NGOs have what capacity, what capabilities, so that we could reach out to them and get them to do the last mile connection, right? So, short answer for that, uh, after that long answer is that there is no credible data, but it's available in bits and pieces across uh, the place, yeah. Uh, Srini, mm -hmm. uh, any other guys? And if anybody wants to raise a hand, uh, we have still three, four minutes to go. Uh, just a piece of uh, information, uh, yeah. Professor Jumbo had uh, joined in and he was there for most of the session. Okay. So, and this is the first time Sydney he has joined the webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our 12th webinar. And one second, I think Manish Patel has a follow-up question. Just a second. Sure. Yeah, go Manish. No, just a, a, a small one. So, Priyank Narayan from Ahsoka is involved in this process? Um, Ashoka does a lot of good work, uh, Manish. Um, um, when you speak about this process, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but, but in general, Ashoka has been promoting individuals. In fact, in fact, um, um, meaning, meaning you have the Ashoka Fellow, which many of you are very familiar with. Ashoka was one of the preeminent organizations which promoted the cause of social enterprises, but primarily focused on the individual rather than the institution. Of course, all these individuals had somehow set up some institution and hence the institution also gets the benefit, but they were focusing on a fellowship for the individual and they do great work in India. Of course, they do great work elsewhere. Um, and and uh, yes, they are part of the ecosystem, okay? Uh, but uh, is Ashoka itself going down on the field and doing work directly? I don't think so. I think they are more of a catalyst. Okay. Um, they bring people who have done good work to a showcase level so that these people get recognized by various other partners. And because of that, some partnerships or some benefits may accrue to that individual and through the individual to the institution. So, um, uh, if you were to take MS Swaminathan Foundation, which does a lot of work on agriculture, um, uh, Akshay Patra, which does a lot of uh, feeding programs, uh, several other NGOs, uh, I don't think Ashoka would be classified as a service delivery NGO. Okay, they're more of an advocacy NGO, if I may use that. Uh, well, what he was another. asking was mm. uh, mm. that he was referring that Priyank, Priyank Narayan. Mm -hmm. who is our alumni. He works for Ashoka University. So are you in touch with him? Oh, 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 oh. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, no, I'm not. I would love to be in touch with uh, uh, him. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mira, who is the publisher of Impact, um, is in touch with some people in Ashoka uh, University. Uh, I completely am sorry about that. I, I completely got it wrong because for me, Ashoka means Ashoka, the organization which runs this social enterprise thing, Ashoka University, very well known uh, of late and uh, partnered with Harvard for their strategic program for nonprofit leaders. I think, I think they are setting the pace for doing good academic research in the nonprofit space, in my opinion, even though the program itself, I think their main program is on liberal arts, but I think uh, um, the IDR, I think, is published with their support, if not by them itself. They are, see the very, very few magazines in the social sector. Stanford Social Innovation Review is one, Alliance is one from the UK, uh, Social Space from Singapore Management University. Um, yeah, I would say, I would claim we are one uh, with impact. IDR, I think is a consistent uh, organize, uh, publication which comes out of Ashoka. Uh, or at least was founded by Ashoka. If I'm, I, I don't know the.
current uh, setup, but I think it is a product of Ashoka and they do a lot of good work. And I don't know this gentleman that you're referring to. I'd love to know him actually. Uh, so Shwini, yeah. uh, don't worry. I mean, I, I can get the details for you. Uh, yeah. the, the entire uh, thought process behind this webinar is to connect our AIM fraternity right. and make it a, a homogeneous fa family. So thank you very much for your very presentation. Uh, you. We, the batch of MBM 98, are very proud of you. Uh, just for other people, uh, for the other participants, just to inform, uh, Shrini is a self-made man. And uh, on a personal note, when he came to AIM, he was in the same section as I was, and he had fees only for the first term. Correct, Shrini, if I'm not mistaken? Right. And uh, he really made it on his own. So he's a self-made guy, and we are all proud of him. And uh, thank you, Shrini, for... Uh, this presentation. Thank you much. Thank you very much for your kind words, Nikhil. And thanks for organizing this. I think this is a great initiative. Uh, and I would, not, I would like to thank everybody for tuning in because uh, I, I, I sincerely appreciate it. My contact details are there. Please feel free to connect at any time. Yeah, I'd really appreciate it. So, um, Nikhil, so I just sign off. Yeah, so thank you very much. I just got, uh, uh, so thank you, Srini, uh, yes. for Anybody this. If anybody has questions, uh, you may send my email to them and they can feel free to connect, man. No worries. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, there is that in, in the in the profile, what he has given, there is his email ID at the bottom. If the PDF file has his email ID, but if anybody wants it, I can uh, pass on. So Srini, uh, yeah. thank you very much uh, yeah. for and, uh, I'd like to thank our classmates for being there. I see Gaurav. <laughs> I see we back. Gaurav, I just Gaurav, I just come in to do last minute CV as he normally does. And, and, was and there, of course, Girish and Harshan. <laughs> I appreciate all of them as well. <laughs> I, 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 I yeah, think bye. I'm going to connect with Vivek after this call. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> bye, bye. 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 bye.